Well, we are in the third message of a series that I've entitled The Coming Battle. The Coming Battle. Now, we started this series with a message that I entitled The Coming Tsunami. If you haven't heard that message, uh, you can grab a CD in the back. You can uh, go to our website or Facebook page. It's on there. Uh, But uh, basically, I'm convinced that we are at the very beginning of a significant shift in the church. You know, I called it the coming tsunami because I'm convinced it's going to hit like a tsunami. And when a tsunami hits, nothing looks the same afterwards. There's a significant shift. And, uh, you know, really, this, this is something that has already started. And this is something that is going to affect generations to come. So in building on that, I also know that, you know, according to the laws of physics... For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? Okay? That applies in the spiritual realm as well. How many of you know that the enemy does not want this new move of God to succeed? Whenever something good is happening in the kingdom of God, you can expect that the enemy is going to be on the offensive. It's going to happen. And last week we started to talk about the battle that I know is not only coming, it's actually just begun, okay? And again, I encourage you to, uh, to check out uh, last week's message. But our primary verse in this is Ephesians 6.12. This is something all of us need to memorize. I encourage you to print this out, hang it in your house so you see it on a regular basis. You know, embroider it on a pillow, get it tattooed somewhere. You know, whatever you need to do to remember this verse. But the key to this verse right here, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle, our battle is not against people. It's against the people that the enemy uses. Excuse me, let me rephrase that. I messed that one up. (laughs) Back up, rewind. Our battle is not against people. Our battle is against the enemy who happens to use people. That's what I meant to say, okay? Our battle is not against people. Our battle is against the enemy who just happens to use people on occasion. Sometimes he doesn't, but many times the enemy uses people. And just because you are a follower of Jesus does not mean that the enemy can't use you. In fact, if you say the enemy can't use you, I promise the enemy is using you. That's just reality. Now, I don't want the enemy to use me. I will actively resist that at every time that I'm aware that the enemy is using me. But there are times that the enemy is using me that I'm not really aware of it. You know, there are times, maybe I've, I've had a stressful day, I'm not feeling well, I'm tired, I'm whatever, and I get a little grumpy. And the enemy might use me against my wife a little bit. Because I know it'll probably come to a shock to a lot of you listening to this message. Sometimes I mess up in my marriage and get a little grumpy and say things to my wife that I shouldn't say. I know nobody else that's married ever has that happen. Nobody else that's married ever does that. But, uh, but, But yeah, it happens. You know, the enemy can use me. Sometimes it's poor timing. Not even necessarily what I said, it's when I say it. You know what I mean? Yeah, my wife's a kindergarten teacher. She has 18 kindergartners that she is supposed to try to socially distance. (laughs) Oh, yeah. She loves teaching kindergarten, but it's a little stressful. And if she walks through the door, the first thing she walks through the door, I look at her and I say, hey, when's dinner? (laughs) That's not the right time to ask that question. The enemy is using me in that moment to cause some extra stress in my wife. There are people involved with the enemy. Some are willing participants. Most of the time, they're not. In fact, there are times I've noticed that people are convinced that they are doing the will of God while they are attacking you on behalf of the enemy. Again, all we've got to do is look at the Apostle Paul back when he was Saul, before he came to know Jesus. He was killing and persecuting Christians, convinced he was doing God's will. 
Then he found out he wasn't. Talk about a come to Jesus moment. Lord, who are you? I'm Christ whom you're persecuting. Oh, uh uh-oh. You know, he found out that he wasn't. But we need to remember that the people are not our enemy. And so today I want to build on this verse in Ephesians chapter 6. Last week we talked about, about the struggle and we talked you know, about a lot of things in that. But today I want to talk about the term spiritual forces. Spiritual forces. And oftentimes within the church when we think about spiritual forces, we think about the demonic. And, and that's certainly accurate at times. It, it really is, especially in the context of this verse. Ephesians six twelve is talking about the demonic. But there are also good spiritual forces as well. Spiritual forces can be both good and bad. A few weeks ago, some of us uh, had the opportunity to go to a, uh, a conference with uh, Dr. Rodney Hogue, and he was talking about spiritual warfare and deliverance, and phenomenal conference. Uh, he wrote a book called Liberated. We have a couple of copies here uh, back in our church uh, book rack back there. If, uh, if you want a good book to read, I think everybody ought to read that book, and if we run out of copies, we'll get more. It's not a problem, but um, one of the things he talked about is he said, you know, he said in spiritual warfare, he said, I know a lot of people that see lots of demons, but they've never seen an angel. He said, and if all you're seeing are demons, there's an issue. You need to pray that you see angels too. You know what I mean? So these spiritual forces, some are good, some are bad. So today I want to take a look at spiritual forces in general. And I mentioned this last week, but there are at least two planes of existence. There may be more. I'm only aware of two. We have the natural plane where we live. Okay, this is in the world that we can see and touch and feel and interact with. This is where we live, the natural plane. But there's also a spiritual realm as well that we don't see or don't see often. And in this spiritual realm live spiritual beings. Now, the spiritual realm interacts regularly with this natural world that we live in. Very regularly, almost seamlessly. Now, we here in this natural realm, we can interact with the spiritual realm as well. By the way, prayer is nothing more than interacting with the spiritual realm. Did you know that? When I pray, I am influencing the spiritual realm. There are times that I know that people have entered into the spiritual realm. We, we read in scripture of, of uh, some of the apostles getting visions and falling into trances. I know people who have had open visions or trances. I know people that have, have seen into the spiritual realm. There are people here in our congregation that regularly see angels. There are people here that occasionally see demons along with those angels. Okay, so I mean there are people that, that do see into the spiritual realm, although that's not incredibly common today. The fact, though, is this spiritual realm exists. So when I talk about spiritual beings, spiritual forces, things like that, what do I mean? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I want to talk about the various spiritual beings that I'm aware of that live in this spiritual realm. Now, there might be more than what I'm talking about today. I'm just talking about what I'm aware of, what what Scripture shows me. And the other thing I want to mention is that what I'm going to be talking about today is going to be an incredibly brief overview. I could literally write thousands of pages on the topic that I'm going to try to finish in 25 minutes. Probably won't happen in 25 minutes, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, I could I could go real deep into this. So this is just going to be an incredibly brief overview. And if anybody's interested in getting deeper or wants to know where I got some of this information, whatever, come to me, let me know. I'm always up for, uh, for sitting down and, and chatting about things like this. But the first spiritual being I want to talk about is, in my opinion, the most important, and that is, of course, God. It will come to no surprise to any of you listening to me that I believe that God is real. I believe that God exists. Now, I am a natural skeptic. Some people see that as a bad thing. Sometimes it is a bad thing. Sometimes it can be a good thing. Um, And I was skeptical about God for a while. But God proved himself to me. There's no question in my mind that God exists. I've seen and experienced things that make no sense outside of the fact that God is real, God, God is interested in us, and God loves us. And so what do I know about God? 
Well, I want to take a moment and talk about who God is, God's nature, that sort of thing. We know of God in, as in the form of what we call the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is an interesting concept. It's one that any explanation that we can give falls kind of short. You know what I mean? Uh, but basically, here's what the Trinity is. Within the nature of the one God, there are three eternally existent and separate entities. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are one, yet they are separate. And some people might be saying, well, that doesn't make any sense, Pastor Harry. You're right. If I could understand it, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't know if I could worship a God that I could fully understand. You know what I mean? Um, this whole thing about the Trinity, the best explanation I've heard for you know, not understanding it is this. A, a pastor one time said, you know, I, I get confused about the Trinity and I try to understand it. He said, but imagine this. Imagine trying to explain music to somebody who was born deaf. Like they have no point of reference, none whatsoever. And they come to you and they say, what's the difference between Led Zeppelin and the Beatles? Well, I know the difference. Many of you know the difference. If you don't know the difference, come see Pastor Michael and I, and we'll explain the difference to you, okay? <laughs> but, you know, what's the difference between country music and rock music? What's the difference between worship music and, and hip-hop? You know, what's, what's the difference between Beethoven and Chris Tomlin? I don't know. I mean, just, just pick. For those of us who can hear, it makes sense to us. But if I was born deaf, if I'd never heard a sound in my life, I would never be able to understand music. Now, I could get a little bit, you know, through vibrations and music theory and, and things like that. To a point, I could understand it, but I'll never fully understand music if I can't hear. How about somebody who was born blind? They've never seen a thing a day in their life. And they walk up to you and they say, what's purple? How would you explain the color purple to somebody who's never seen a color. Be pretty doggone hard, wouldn't it? So I can't really fully explain the Trinity. Why? Because it's beyond my understanding. I just know that there is one God. And this one God exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three, yet one. Here's the thing about God. God is all-knowing. The theological Bible nerd word that we use for this is omniscient. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows everything. And I mean like really knows everything. Some of us think we do, <laughs> but God really does, okay? You know, we've all run into people who think they do. God really does. God is omniscient. God knows everything. God is also omnipotent which is the Bible nerd word for all-powerful. There is nothing that God cannot do. God is all-powerful. We're talking about the being who said, let there be light before light ever existed, before anybody even had a concept of what light was. God knew what it was, and God said, let there be light, and boom, light happened. We're talking about the God that spoke the universe and creation into existence. The God that created the laws of physics. The God that created the laws of science and nature. He is all powerful. The Bible says that God is omnipresent, which is the Bible nerd word for God is everywhere. In the Psalms it says, if I go up into the heavens, you're there. If I go into the depths, you're there. Where can I flee from your presence? God is everywhere. Reminds me of a story I heard from an evangelist many years ago. This is probably about 30 years ago. He was speaking over in Wellsboro, and uh, they had asked me if I would run the sound for the evangelist. They had uh, rented out the Wellsboro High School and was doing an evangelistic crusade. Lots of people got saved. It was awesome. And I'm running the sound system. The evangelist was telling a story, and he was talking about the omnipresence of God. And he said, I remember when I was a kid, he said, I knew that my mom did not like me jumping on the bed, that every time I jumped on the bed, I got in trouble. He said, but I mean, what kid doesn't like to jump on the bed? I mean, I'm an adult, and I like to jump on the bed. It's fun, okay? Jumping on the bed is fun. And he said, well, there was one day that said he was jumping on his bed, and he heard his mom walking up the stairs. 
So as a lot of kids would try to do, he tried to make it look like he wasn't jumping on his bed. He said, I, I hopped down in that bed, pulled the covers up to my chin and tried to pretend like I was asleep. <laughs> he said, my mom opened the door and looked in and all she said was, God can see what you're doing and closed the door and walked away. He said, so when I got up, I realized God could see what I was doing. He said, before I started jumping on the bed, I pulled the shades. <laughs> yeah. Now the shades don't even work. God is everywhere. God sees everything. God knows everything. He is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-present. God is also immutable. Immutable means God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, if you want to know what God the Father looks like, look at me. There has never been a time that God the Father did not look like Jesus. You want to know what God the Father's like? Look at Jesus. He is the embodiment of God the Father. God is immutable. He does not change. God is timeless. God lives outside of time. God created time. You know, when God said, let there be the sun and the moon and the stars, that was the creation of time. Prior to that, there wasn't time. There was nothing to measure time by. God lives outside the confines of time. Again, something that is hard for us to understand, but that's who God is. Here's what I also know about God. Scripture tells me that God is love. He is the very definition of love. He's the embodiment of love. Well, what is, what is love like? Well, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us it's patient. It's kind. It's not selfish. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not rude. It's not proud. It keeps no record of wrong. All these things apply to God because God is love. He is not some cosmic bully just waiting for you to misbehave so he can strike you with lightning. You know, you've heard me say that before. That's not Yahweh. That's Zeus. Okay. I don't worship Zeus. I don't worship Baal. I worship Yahweh, and he is love. Now, sometimes love requires correction. I have great parents. They love Jesus. I was never abused a day in my life, never worried about where I was going to get my next meal. I, mean, I know now as an adult with kids of my own that there were times my parents were probably worried about where the next meal was coming from. They were probably worried about, you know, are we going to pay all the bills and buy the food and take care of everything that needs to be taken care of? I mean, as adults, that's reality sometimes. But as a kid, I never worried. Never worried. Because I knew mom and dad were going to take care of me. They, they loved me. But I also knew that if I flubbed my dub, there were consequences. And depending on how bad that dub was flubbed would depend on how bad those, comp, you know, those consequences were. But they were always done out of love. They were always done with a motivation of turning me into a decent human being. It was never punishment for the sake of punishment. It was punishment for the sake of, you need to stop this behavior and become more like this because this is the behavior we expect of you. So if there is discipline from our Heavenly Father, and sometimes there is, it's always with that in mind. It is through the, po the heart of love. You know, if I, if I look at my kids and say, I love you, but then regularly look for any excuse to beat the snot out of them, am I a loving dad? No, I'm an abusive father and need to be turned in. You know what I mean? Of course, my kids are all big enough where they could beat back now, so I'm not going to do that. But, um, but you get what I'm saying. God is the very embodiment of love. He loves you more than you could possibly imagine. And now, put all of this that we know about him. God is all-knowing. He knows everything we've ever done. Those things that we don't want anybody to know about, those things that if they became public knowledge, you would want to crawl under a rock and die. Yeah, God knows about that. But guess what? He loves you. He loves you. And that's not going to change because God is unchanging. I could go on and on and on. Let me just say, surmise it like this. He's a good God and he's in a good mood. And he loves you. Moving along, we have other spiritual beings that we need to talk about, spiritual forces. We have angels. What are angels? Well, honestly, the Bible doesn't really talk a whole lot about angels. Now, it mentions angels quite a bit, but it doesn't really talk about the origin of angels at all. All I know is that angels are created beings, that God created 
the angels, sometime before he created man. Sometime before he created the earth as we know it now, God created the angels. So angels are created spiritual beings. I know that there are different levels of angels. Like in the Bible, we, we talk about the archangel Michael. We talk about the archangel Gabriel. We talk about cherubim and seraphim and, and, and different types of angels. And I don't, I don't know this for sure. I mean, you can read in the Bible and we can guess on this. But, but it seems to me like there might be just like different levels of, of authority and, and ability within the angelic realm. Okay? You know, like you've got your entry-level angels. Then you got your supervisors. And that you got, then you got your managers. And then your district managers. And then your regional managers. You, you know what I'm saying? Kind of, kind of structure like that? Probably. I just know that they are created beings. God often uses angels as messengers. We see several times in scripture about an angel appearing to somebody with a message. You know, the most popular one is in the, in the story of the birth of Jesus, how the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, hey, Mary, guess what? God chose you. Many other times we see angels appearing as messengers. We see angels as warriors. One of my favorite stories about angelic warriors is when the prophet Elisha. Oh, I just, this is just an awesome story. The nation of Syria was, was coming against Israel, and, and Syria had a pretty big army. Okay, they were they were pretty well known, and and the the king of Syria was trying to uh, trying to attack Israel. But every time he came up with a plan, Israel knew about the plan because God told Elisha the prophet about the plans that the king of Syria was making, and so Elisha would talk to the king of Israel. And they would prepare for whatever attack or plans that the Syrian king had. And in fact, somebody, one of the Syrian king's officials, came to him and said, "Hey, it's like Elisha standing right here in your bedroom with you." God is telling Elisha all your plans. So the Syrian king said, go get Elisha. I want him dead. So the Syrian army went after Elisha. And it says Elisha was in this house. One morning he woke up and looked outside. And he's surrounded by the Syrian army. And Elisha's servant's like, whoa, what are we going to do? And he's like freaking out, which I can't say as I blame him. If I woke up tomorrow morning and my house was surrounded by an enemy army, I'm probably going to be a little nervous too. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just natural. That's normal. And Elisha's like, ah, don't worry about it. Like, what do you mean, don't worry about it? You see these guys? He's like, no, no, no. Those that are with us are greater than, than those out there. And he's, his servant is like, what are you talking about, Elisha? It's just the two of us. And Elisha prayed for his servant's eyes to be opened. And when his servant's eyes were opened, he looked up and the armies of heaven were surrounding them and protecting them. angelic warriors heard the story of a missionary who was in a country where the enemy did not want him a lot of witchcraft a lot of demonic things going on and this missionary was there and the devil wanted to come against him and so the devil stirred up uh, some folks to, to go and attack the missionary and they were planning it the one night but it never happened and the next morning a couple of the guys that went in that group to go attack the missionary came to the missionary and said, who were those big people in your yard last night? The missionary's like, what are you talking about? There were these two huge guys in your front yard with swords that wouldn't let us get close to you. There were angels in the yard that the people that the enemy sent to attack that missionary saw. The missionary didn't know. But God knew the plans of the enemy and sent warring angels to protect his servant. There are warring angels that are here to protect you too, by the way. Seriously. They are here to protect you. They are, they're also servants of God. Angels are servants of God. They carry out God's will, whatever that might be. Angels are also pretty powerful beings. And, and I want to use the word power carefully. Um, it's probably not the best word to use because like really, you know, God is all powerful. God is the source of, of, of power and whatnot, but angelic beings, spiritual beings have abilities that we as normal human beings don't have. Okay. So I use the word power. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but they have abilities that I don't have. They can do things that I cannot do in the natural. Think, think about 
Think about angels here. You know, when Moses was getting ready to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, one angel, one, one angel in one night went through the entire nation of Egypt and took care of the firstborn in every household in Egypt that didn't have the blood of the lamb around the doorpost. That's one angel, one night. I ain't messing with them. <laughs> not by myself, not in my natural. They're very powerful. They are created beings. And I'm going to talk now about another spirit being. We know him as Lucifer, Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, Slewfoot, Wormwood, whatever you want to call him. Lots of different names. Did I hear somebody say mother-in-law? I don't know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Although that does remind me of a story. Rabbit trail, rabbit trail here. Okay. Sunday morning church, middle of the service, all of a sudden the devil walks through the door and comes right down the aisle. Everybody in that church gets freaked out. I mean, they're jumping out windows. The pastor runs out the back door. Everybody leaves, all except for this one old lady sitting in the front row like this. Well, the devil walks up and looks at that old lady, and he says, don't you know who I am? She said, yes, sir, I do. He said, aren't you afraid of me? She said, no, sir, I'm not. Well, why aren't you? She said, because I've been married to your brother for 43 years. <laughs> so, okay, bad joke. <laughs> bad joke, bad joke. A couple things about the devil. First and foremost, the devil is not the opposite of God. I'm going to say that again. The devil is not the opposite of God. The devil is the opposite of Michael the archangel. That means the devil is a created being. That means the devil is not all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. No, not even close. The devil is a created being, not the opposite of God. Popular society would like you to think, okay, yeah, there's God and his opposite is the devil. No, not even close. Not even close. The devil is a created being. Also, as a side note, contrary to what society would lead you to believe, the devil is not in hell yet. Now, as I read scripture, the devil's ultimate fate is the lake of fire. Ultimately, that is where the devil will be. But the devil is not in hell. How do I know that? Well, you read in Job chapter 1, it says that, that all the, you know, the, the spiritual beings gathered before God and the devil was one of them. The devil walks into the presence of God and God said, where you been? And the devil said, I've been roaming around on the earth. Been walking around on the earth. You know, 1 Peter talks about you know, the, the devil roaring, walking around you know, like a roaring lion. He exists not in hell. He's not in hell yet. He's in the spirit realm and in the natural realm. Now, again, not much is known about the devil's origin. We don't really know where the devil came from. We know for sure the devil's a created being, far inferior to God, nowhere close to God. But many people look at the book of Isaiah chapter 14, there's a passage in Isaiah 14 that when it was originally written, it was actually originally written against the king of Babylon, predicting the king of Babylon's fall. But throughout much of church history, it's also been uh, looked at as, in addition to applying to the fall of the king of Babylon, also applying to the fall of Lucifer. That was the devil's original name. And we read in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. This is talking about Lucifer. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the, on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I believe that the devil was originally an angel. A very powerful angel. Very powerful angel. 
And one day, for reasons that are beyond me, the devil decided, I want to be like God. And decided to rebel against God. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus talks about how he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. The Bible tells us that the devil is an accuser. In fact, the word Satan or Satan literally means adversary or accuser. Okay, the devil wants to accuse. How does he do that? Well, he likes to remind us of every dumb thing we've ever done. You know, and, and that's not new. It happens to me. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you're laying down in bed at night and just before you go to sleep, every stupid thing you've ever done in your life runs through your mind. And it's like, okay, I know that I've been forgiven of that. I've repented of that years ago. Sometimes, you know, 30 years ago, I repented of that. Yet the devil, how could God love somebody like you? Look what you did. Oh, yeah, you do some good things too, but look at that lousy stuff that you did. How could God love you? How could you call yourself a servant of God? Oh, he might be forgiving all those other people, but he's not going to forgive you. Those are lies straight from the pit of hell. Other lies that I know some of you hear regularly. You're worthless. You're stupid. You'll never amount to anything. You're ugly. You're fat. How could anybody ever love you? Well, they don't really love you. They're just faking it. They're just pretending. Or to some of the younger folks in this room, you sent that message three minutes ago and they haven't replied yet. They hate you. It's been 20 minutes and they haven't replied yet. They don't like you. And we all know that there's like a million and one reasons why it take, may take somebody more than 20 minutes to reply. You know what I mean? A million and one reasons. But the devil's an accuser and he's going to want to get inside your head. We're going to talk more about that in a couple of weeks and what we can do about that. But he wants to get inside your head and lie and accuse and condemn. Scripture says that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit will convict you but never condemn you. And here's the difference. Conviction will bring you closer to God. The goal of conviction is to draw you closer to God. Condemnation makes you feel worthless and will push you away from God. That is not God. If you're feeling condemned, I promise you it is not God. That is the enemy, and he's a pig. Don't believe him. The Holy Spirit's conviction will draw you closer to God. In the parable of the sower, Jesus is talking about, you know, a, a person going out and planting seeds. And, and in the ancient times, you know, like today we have farm equipment that will go out and plant big fields with lots of, you know, different seeds and they'll do it just right. But back in Jesus' day, what they'd do is they would, they would plow up the ground and then they'd have this, this person with a big bag of seeds and they'd, they'd reach, in the seeds with their, reach in the bag with their hand and they'd take these seeds and they'd scatter them like this. You know, they'd do it by hand. Okay. And, and so Jesus said one day, this, this sower, this guy that was scattering seeds, he went out and he's, he's planting his garden and you know, and some of those seeds fell in good soil and some of them fell in soil that wasn't so good. You know, like they started to grow, but then weeds came in. He said, but then, you know, there's some of that, some of that seed fell on some, some rocky hard soil. And that's when the, when the devil comes in and he steals it away. You know, the devil wants to steal the good news of the gospel away from people. He'll want people to, to believe this warped and twisted version of the gospel that has nothing to do with the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And if when you listen to it, if it's not good news for everybody, it's not gospel. It's not. And the devil will want to try to steal the gospel truth away from you. He's looking for people to, de to devour. Jesus says that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus also said that when the devil speaks, he, or when the devil, excuse me, the devil, when the devil lies, he's speaking his native language. Jesus said the devil is a liar and the father of liars. The next spiritual beings would be demons. These are also created beings. 
And again, Scripture doesn't talk a whole lot about demons. I mean, it mentions them, but it really doesn't talk directly about their origin. Some people believe that demons are fallen angels. Where do they get that from? Well, in Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, it says, And another sign appeared in the heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Many people will take this and mean that, you know, the, this, this red dragon was the devil and he convinced a third of the angels to join him in his rebellion against God and that the demonic, the, the demons are nothing more than fallen angels, you know, beings that once were servants of God but rebelled against God and now they are servants of the devil. Jude, Jude 1.6 talks about angels who abandon their positions and are kept in chains until the day of judgment. Other people have believed, now this is something that's fairly new to me, I just learned this pretty recently, but there are people out there that believe that, that demons are the disembodied souls of the Nephilim, or Nephilim, however you want to pronounce it. We read about the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6, where it talks about the sons of God coming down to the earth and, and marrying the, the, the daughters of man uh, and creating a, uh, a hybrid spiritual human being. And it says this is where the giants came from and all this kind of stuff. And, and that when, when the flood came after Genesis 6, you know, the flood came and it destroyed the earth, these Nephilim, because they weren't pure spirit beings, they weren't human, they didn't have any place to go. And so they've wandered the earth, and that is why they want to possess the bodies of humans. Now, I don't know if that's accurate or not. That's a theory. Who knows? I do know that demons are real. I've encountered them more than once. They're very real. But they're created beings. Demons want to influence people. They want to possess people. In other words, they want their spirit to take up residence inside a human body. And that can look many different ways. In Scripture, we see that looking like, uh, you know, we have the, the, the guy that was uh, uh, from uh, the, the Gadarene demoniac, they, they call him. It was that guy that was possessed by like a thousand demons. And Jesus went and he, he asked, he's like, what's your name? And, and actually, I just really think he was talking to the guy and asking the guy what his name was. Uh, but the demons responded and said, we are, you know, our name is Legion because we're many. And, and basically, he Here's the other thing I, I, I think is kind of, I mean, I kind of laugh about it a little bit, but when the demons would see Jesus, they'd start to freak out because they knew who he was. We know who you are. You're the son of God. And Jesus would say, shut up. The people don't, they're not ready for that yet. Did you come to, to torment us before it's time, Jesus? They were scared. They were nervous. And, and the demons inside this, this man from, Gad, from uh, Gadarene, they, they, they asked Jesus, hey, don't send us to the pit yet. It's not, it's not time yet. Can we go to those pigs? Would you let us enter those pigs? And the pastor Harry paraphrased Jesus as basically, I don't care where you, just get out of this guy. You got no business in him. He's my child. He belongs to me. You just go. If you want to go in the pigs, go in the pigs. I don't care. So they went into the pigs. Pigs ran off a cliff, drowned. You know, you can read the story. So we see that. We see uh, in scripture, sometimes the reason why people are sick is because they are possessed by an evil spirit. Now, not all sickness is demonic. Okay, sometimes I get sick just because I live in a fallen world where sickness exists. You know, it's not an evil spirit that made me sick. It was, you know, this person at Walmart that sneezed on me that made me sick. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes it is demonic. Sometimes it is because of an evil spirit. Again, we see that in Scripture. There are times where it plainly says Jesus cast out spirits and they were healed, and other times where it just says he just healed them. It wasn't a spirit involved. They were just sick, and he healed them. Sometimes demonic possession can mimic mental health symptoms. And again, sometimes what looks like a mental health issue is demonic. I've seen it. Sometimes it's not demonic at all. Sometimes it's just an illness, you know, mental illness. It's still an illness. It's still something that God wants to heal you from. It's something that you can be healed from, but it's not always demonic. 
Sometimes there are other reasons for it. Now, I do know that demons often will influence people who have physical or mental or emotional issues because their defenses are down. So oftentimes they will influence them, but the cause of that is not always demonic. Many times it is, many times it's not. How do we know the difference? We can't in our natural know the difference. That's where the Holy Spirit steps in. We need to rely on on wisdom from the Lord as to what the cause of that is. You know, are they sick because of a demonic spirit? Are they sick for some other reason? You know, sometimes it doesn't matter what the reason is. God just called us to, to pray for their healing. And sometimes that healing means casting out a spirit. Sometimes that healing means God stepping in and doing a miracle. You follow what I'm saying? It's not always demonic. It oftentimes can be. So, what does all this mean for me? What do I want you to take away from what I talked about today? First and foremost, you must remember, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Now let's go back to when I was talking about the nature of God being Trinity. God is one but three. There is no part of God that is greater than the other. It's not like God the Father is more powerful than God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. No, they are all equally powerful. Since the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, the full power of God lives in me. Not a watered-down version. It's not Holy Spirit light. The fullness of God lives inside of me as a believer in Christ. I have access through the Holy Spirit to the full power of God. I don't have to be afraid of any evil spirit. None. I don't have to be afraid. I'm not afraid. Why? Because God the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. You know what I mean? Let me give you an example. Let's say I walk out of church and there's somebody standing out there and they want to beat me up. Well, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Know what I mean? I don't like to fight. I'm about 95% pacifist. Now, the 5% of me that's not will clean your clock, but 95% of me is pacifist and I don't want to fight you, okay? Okay. And the 5% of me that's not, Jesus is working on that, okay? Not quite there yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. Let's say I walk out, and this guy's out there. He wants to beat me up. But I happen to turn around, and I look. And coming behind me is Bradley and Randy and Mike and Riley and Ray and Bokey and Jim and Dave and Rusty and my dad and Billy. And then behind them is Shana. Because, I mean, if they can't take care of it, she's there to mop things up. Am I going to be afraid of that guy? No. Why? Because my friends are coming in behind me and they're going to back me up. I ain't afraid of you. Because, what's that? Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> if he tries to attack me and they, you know, my friends take care of him, then Shana will be there to pray for his healing afterwards and then leading him to Jesus, okay? You, know, you want to come to Jesus now or you want those guys to come back? Which, which do you choose, okay? Um, I'm, I'm, mess, I'm messing. But, you know, I'm not going to be afraid because I got my friends to back me up. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be afraid of an evil spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is there to back me up. In fact, He doesn't need to back me up. Holy Spirit's there to take care of it. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to be afraid. Because again, back in Ephesians 6.12, it reminds me that my struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And if you continue in that, it talks about the tools that God has given us to resist and stand up against this struggle. But the fact is we already have victory. Bill Johnson said this. He said, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. 
The victory is ours. It's already there. Jesus already gave us the victory. The fullness of God lives inside of me. I have the victory. I have nothing to fear from the devil and his minions. The only power they have is the power I give them. The only power they have over me is the power I give them. Maybe there's an area of my life I haven't completely surrendered to God yet. They can maybe get in through that area. Now, here's the cool thing about God. I don't have to stand here confused about how they got in. If I'm like, okay, God, obviously there's something that I haven't turned over to you. Reveal that to me. Let me know. You know, and I don't serve a God that's going to look down upon me from heaven. It's like, oh, well, you know, stinks to be you, Harry. Sorry, you got to figure it out all on your own. I ain't telling you. No. God's going to let me know. Maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to me directly. Maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to one of you, and you come to me and say, God revealed this to me, Pastor Harry, and you give me whatever God said. Maybe I'll be reading scripture and something will pop off the page. Whatever. God will let me know in a way that I will understand where that problem is coming from. And then it's up to me whether I'm going to do anything about it or not. Because sometimes we know exactly what the problem is. We just don't want to do anything about it. Happens to what's in the natural all the time. You got to change your diet and exercise. Uh, Doc, can't you just give me a pill? Because I don't want to change my diet or exercise. Now, if I change my diet and exercise, maybe that physical problem will go away. Because maybe the reason why that physical problem is there is because of my lousy diet. But I have to choose whether I'm going to get rid of that or not. I, I promise you, if you surrender it all to Jesus, you don't need to worry about anything. There's a story I love to share in, in moments like this. And I don't know if the story's true or not. I like to believe that it's true because it's a really cool story. Um, but it's about a, about a man of faith that lived many years ago. His name was Smith Wigglesworth. And if you don't know anything about Smith Wigglesworth, go home and Google him. You'll love it. That, 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 that guy, I mean, he got it. Okay. And as the story goes, one night Smith Wigglesworth is in bed and he's asleep. He hears a noise downstairs. He goes down to investigate, and he walks down, and there sitting in the living room is the devil. The devil just looks at him, and Smith said, ah, it's just you, turned around and went back to bed. Some people are like, well, how could he do that? Because Smith knew who he was. He knew the authority he had. He knew that the devil had no authority over him whatsoever. He wasn't scared. Turned around and went back to bed. I'm not going to let the devil interrupt my sleep schedule. I'm not going to let him speak when I can and can't sleep. Forget it. I got the Holy Spirit living inside of me. I don't need to worry about that. By the way, there's no doubt in my mind that the presence of the Holy Spirit is here today. But I've been in churches where I wondered. I've wondered, is God in this building this morning? But I tell you who I never have to wonder. The devil and his minions come to church every Sunday. Their attendance is better than yours. They don't miss a Sunday. Why? Because they want to divide us. They want us to start fighting amongst ourselves. They want to come in and, and get us arguing over politics and theology and, and, and you know, what color the, the carpet should be. I mean, which is why I'm glad we don't argue because who can beat orange shade carpet on the walls? I mean, you just can't beat this. Nobody, you know. For those of you who are watching online, we literally do have orange shag carpeting on the walls. It was really groovy back in the 70s when they put it up, and it works really well. You have to come and visit and get your picture. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as dumb as it sounds, there are churches that almost split over the color of the carpet, and I'm like, who cares? It's carpet. And the devil's smiling. I remember a story I'd heard many years ago about a church that split because an artist had come in and painted a beautiful mural on their one wall. And it was a mural of the Garden of Eden. And the church split because the artist put a belly button on Adam and Eve. And people were mad. Well, God created them with his hands. They didn't have a belly button. 
Well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I mean, they didn't need a belly button, but maybe when God was forming Adam out of the dust of the earth, he went. <laughs> or if Adam had an Audi, maybe he went like that. I don't know. Who cares? I don't know if they had a belly button or not. When I see him in heaven, I'll ask, hey, Adam, could you lift up your shirt a little bit? You know, I don't, I don't care. Yet people got so passionate about that, it caused a split in the church. It's dumb. Now, I get it. Like, if I were to stand up here and say, oh, there's many ways to heaven. You don't need to know Jesus. You can, you can go. You can do, just do whatever, man. It's all good. Now, if I say that, you better have a problem with it. Now, over that, I can see an issue. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> Barb just said, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> actually, she said, you got some splaining to do, Ricky. It was actually, you got some splaining to do, Lucy. It was, yes, Lucy. Lucy had the splaining to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are issues that it's worth debating, contending for. There are convictions I will die for. But I'm not going to lose a relationship over an opinion. I'm not going to lose a relationship over something that doesn't matter. Yet the devil's going to try all the time. He did it just this last week, a couple of times in my life. Tried to sneak in. Tried to cause division. Met with our church leadership this last Sunday night over at my house. We had a wonderful, it was an amazing time with Jesus. Amazing time. And, and the topic that we talked about was the importance of leadership being in unity. And everyone's like, yes, and we're all on the same page. And I kid you not. That night before I went to bed, the devil came in like the pig that he is and tried to cause a disunity. A couple days later, same thing happened. The devil came in, tried to cause disunity. And I just, you know, Sunday night I was a little upset, but I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to let it happen. A couple days later, I just kind of laughed. Like, yeah, good, good try. Not happening. Not happening. We need to be alert. We need to be cautious. We need to be aware that he's going to try to cause division. He's going to try to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. But remember that he's no match for the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Jesus said, yes, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life. But not just life. You have life more abundantly. Not just life. You're not just surviving. You're not just making it. You're not just squeaking by. It's an abundant life. Because I tell you, when God gets involved, there is abundance. Listen to Bill Johnson this morning. This will be the last thing I say before I, before I close in prayer. Bill Johnson said, you ever notice that when Jesus multiplied food, it was never just enough? There was always an abundance. There was always leftovers. And none of it went to waste. When God does something in your life, there's going to be abundance. There's going to be leftovers that he's going to want you to use in smart ways. It's not going to go to waste, but you're going to get more than what you need because why? He's a loving father. He loves us. He wants us to thrive. He wants to use us to build his kingdom. He wants to make sure we have exactly what we need so we can look at the devil and say, not today, devil. Not today. You are not affecting my life, my family, my church, because this is, you know, you can say this is your church. If you say Harvest Family Fellowship is my church, yes, because this is where we as a family gather. You know, my house is right back behind it. My wife also says that's her house. My kids say that's their house. Even my two kids that have their own place, that's their house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's ours. This is ours. Not in my house, devil. Not in my community, devil. You're not going to move in this town. Not going to happen. Not on my watch. Not on our watch. Uh-uh. No way. Not in this county. Uh-uh. Not happening. Northern Pennsylvania, get out of here. Not happening. Nope. Not here. Southern New York, hey, beat it. Get out. Go. Where are we going to go? Huh? Go to Jersey. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> joke. That was a joke. That was a joke. I know some wonderful people from Jersey, and one of them is probably watching right now, and he's going to kick my butt later. <laughs> Sam, it was a joke. I'm just saying, Sam, it was a joke. <laughs> but 
Anyway, God is good. And he's in a good mood. He lives inside of me. And I got nothing to be scared of, nothing to be worried about. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, I thank you that you've not left us defenseless against an all-powerful enemy, that you have put us in a place against an enemy that has already been defeated. His defeat has already taken place. He's done. He's already beat. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to recognize that, to realize that. Lord, I know that your word says that you don't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I pray that you'd help us to walk in that power, in that love, and in that sound mind that you have given us. To step out in the authority that is ours through you. That we could build your kingdom in this place, Lord. That we could influence the lives around us, Lord. That your kingdom would be manifest in this region through what you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.